And welcome back. So for today's episode, I'm absolutely thrilled to have on our next guest. She is incredibly talented, two-time Emmy Award-winning director. She's taught at USC, USC for over 10 years, uh, an author, and somehow finds time to teach in the midst of all of this. I cannot wait to hear what she has to share with us. You're going to want to follow her on her website at MaryLouBelli.com, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So please give a warm welcome to Mary Lou Belli. Thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I'm just so, um, I have a million questions, of course, but how did you get into directing? Was it something that you always wanted to do? No, as a matter of fact, um, I took one directing class in college. I was, I was bossy because I had already stage managed, but I was really not a very good director. A lot of that had to do with a point of view on the world, and I was very, very young. I graduated from college in three years, so you can imagine. Um, but, uh, and it was an actor who pulled me aside and said, you're a director, when, you know, in the midst of my coaching somebody. And I thought about it, and I thought, you know, a lot has happened since college, and that experience of, you know, evaluating my skill set and thinking, no, you're not very good at this. And then I thought, you know what? This, this really could be exactly where I belong, because by that point in my acting career, um, I realized that I really didn't like performing very much. <laughs> and what I really loved to do was rehearse. Oh. So, and solving the puzzle of the character or the story was always tantamount in terms of what I was going for. So um, directing just fit right in. And I, and I, I pretty instantly um, recognized that, especially through my work in the theater. Because I, what I did was I went to the theater company where I was known as an acting member. And I said, hey, I want to try this directing thing. Yeah. And it worked out. <laughs> well, that's awesome. Did you, so if you were already kind of naturally inclined to be a director, I'm always interested in how what we do for a living or on a daily basis, how it can change our mindset or our outlook on the world. Did you notice any sort of like shifts in? Yeah, I will tell you. And it's a, it's a very specific thing. Um, uh, although I, I consider myself a pretty warm and effusive person, um, there's a lot in my life that I close down in terms of, I think as a, an, a, an actor, emotional availability has to be one of your strongest assets. Um, and uh, I no longer needed that. I needed compassion and empathy. Right. But those are different from me going, hey, world, this is me, all my insides. And I don't do that anymore. So basically, um, my circle of friends was a little bit tighter and um, I wasn't, and I don't mean this to be un, un, ungenerous, but I was, I just became less um, emotionally available to everyone. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I have to say, and it's to this day, I always say acting is way harder than directing. And it's particularly because of that asset that you need. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I find there. Oh, I'm more private. Yeah, yeah, I'm such a private person. And when I started doing stand up, people are like, you got to get over that real quick. So I'm like, oh, because I feel like it's different with acting. I could be completely naked on, well, not for real, but like naked on stage, but it's not really me being naked, it's the character. But yeah. then with stand up, I'm like, oh, okay, I got to talk about my real life. But what about my real life do I want to talk about? <laughs> do, am I okay with uh, just anybody and hearing? And yeah. the place where I, I do, I'm, I'm, I'm writing some fiction now, and that's where I'm going, hmm, this is, this is a little bit more revealing. And, and although I have to say I've loved it, you can hide in, in what, the same thing you're talking about when you're playing a character. I can hide behind the fictionalization of these things. But it's also coming through my personal emotional lens. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm so, ha, ha, so you started writing fiction. Have you been writing it like do you have other fiction out no, already this, this or is my just first piece. it's it's nearly done it's it's um i don't think it'll go out before i start my first job this season but i'm hoping that before the end of the year um i have it out to some publishers so we'll see it's a collection of short stories but all related and all sequential and uh, we'll see but i also have my fifth nonfiction book out to a um publisher right now so wow. maybe i'll get a book deal for my nonfiction before the end of the year as well. That's amazing. And we can find that on your social media and of course your website yeah, yeah. when it becomes available. Right. Exactly, awesome. exactly. And, cool. all, and all four, you know, I talk about my other four books on my website already. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, when I was doing a little bit more research in order to prepare for the interview, I saw, I did not know this, which I'm probably shouldn't just admit so readily, but that you directed Girlfriends. Oh, for, for like seven, six years. Yeah. Six and years. I'm like, just, <laughs> I loved that show. It's one of my all time favorite shows. I did too. And you know, this, this, the fact that it's available on Netflix, you know, as of a few weeks ago, yeah. I, um, I've always stayed in touch very closely with Tracy um, and, and Persia as well. Um, but not as much with, um, and Keisha Sharp, um, but not as much with Golden and Jill. And it's kind of fun because Golden and I have been, you know, you know, answering each other's tweets and things like that. So it's been fun to, because you have to know, you don't spend that long with, with a, a group that amazing and not fall in love. Right. I, mean, I love each and every one of them and Reggie. Um, you know, so it was, it was great and uh, to see them all together and some of the stuff they've done together for the release, yeah. just to see them playing together and having fun. It just brings it all back. And there was a little thing, you know, you think, oh, does anybody remember this? Well, Tracy Ross, every time I would walk on the soundstage in the morning, she would say, and she was always on time and early, uh. she would say, Mary Lou! <laughs> and as a result, I was Mary Lou! And the first thing that Golden did when she got back in touch was she said, Mary Lou, with like, oh, 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 you, 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 you. Oh. So everybody remembers that. And it's also where I met Yvette Nicole Brown and Jennifer Lewis. I mean, I have to tell you, and God bless her, Mara Brock Akeel, who gave me that job and then hired me for the game. And now I'm working for her production company on Black Lightning for the second oh. season as well. So, um, Girlfriends is a really, really big part of my life. That's amazing. And an amazing show it that I hope the whole world discovers again. Yes, yes. So if you're, when, I mean, obviously you're listening to this podcast if you're hearing me talk about this, but if you haven't seen it yet, you want to you wanna check it out immediately and yes. you don't have to take our word for it. Like, it's fantastic. It it's is. so good. So um, do you have any life lessons from girlfriends or things that you learned on set that... Um, change your life or you think could change others? Yeah, I, I will tell you, and th this is not a good um, uh, lesson, um, and it wasn't mine to learn, but it was mine to have to, you know, I do a huge amount of advocacy work. And on that show, I had invited um, a young, up and coming, but pretty inexperienced director on the set. And in the in the idea that she was being helpful, she overstepped her bounds. Mm -hmm. And I have to tell you, as a result, no one was ever allowed to visit set again. So basically one mistake, you know, and maybe it was mine in not giving out instructions, if you're going to come on set, this is how you should behave. Mm -hmm. But, um, and again, it wasn't malicious. It was, she was trying to be helpful. But um, one of the cast members didn't like it. And I completely understand. The cast member was completely in the right. So um, now when I have people shadow me or, you know, I'm, I'm pretty clear about how you should behave on set. Um, and even if you have good intentions, you're a guest there. And you need to behave as a guest and not overstep your bounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, it's really good for people to remember that even when they're trying to be helpful to not necessarily think of if it's helpful from their perspective, but from what everybody else needs. Do they that want is that? So help? perceptive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, and that it, it not only, and if you make a mistake, sometimes there's repercussions for a long time coming. Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for everyone else, like, yeah, that didn't even have a part in that initial yeah. And, and then like just personal stuff, you know, um, I did learn a great lesson as a director. There was a, um, uh, an episode and I don't know if it was the first one that Yvette Nicole Brown did or the second one. Cause she came back, she recurred on that show that I had directed her in. But, um, there was a, a, a huge scene and, and, um, Jennifer Lewis, who was playing the mother of Yvette and Jill, um, and 
Jennifer Lewis's character has a drinking problem or a drinking challenge and she goes off the wagon and she, she has this huge, huge drunk scene for which she went on to win an award or multiple awards for, for this performance. And um, she came up to me after the first run through and, you know, she, sitcoms have this wonderful time when you can rehearse for three days. So what she, Jen knew she was going to do on camera on Friday yeah. was not what she was presenting on Monday. Monday was an exploration. Mm -hmm. And as a result, um, you know, she was trying one thing on Monday and then she expanded what she wanted to try on Tuesday. And then, you know, it was kind of like a pendulum swim swinging and finding that sweet spot of what's really, really drunk, really, really truthful and really, really funny all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And she came up to me on the second day and said, trust me. And you know, it's Jennifer Lewis. I mean, the body of work already was astounding. Mm -hmm. And I did. And I have to tell you, you know, one of the things I find with young directors is that they're, they're nervous Nellies and when there's pressure on the outside of, no, this is what we want from her. And I, my main job that week was to guard Jennifer's process. And that's what I did. And it's, it was a great, great lesson in terms of being a director is that you have to take care of your cast and where they are in terms of their exploration of a character. Because um, executives, you know, people behind me <laughs> um, are result oriented. And acting is not a result craft. It's a process craft. So that was, um, and as a result, you know, Jen has requested me on things, you know? I mean, I, I, I'm, fingers crossed, she just got a, a new show and I'm hoping, hoping, hoping we get to work together again because I adore working with her and I adore her as a person. And she's just, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and I trust her. Yeah. And she knows I trust her. And she knows that I trust actors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love how you put it and I've never really thought of directing as the sort of bridge between two worlds in a way. Oh, like, right. And it almost seems like the sort of life lesson takeaway I'm thinking here too is how applicable it would be for parents when you're yeah. parenting, you know, each child is going to need something a little bit different in order for them to grow and do their best. And then you have your responsibilities of making sure that, you know, they're an upstanding citizen and safe and all of those other things and just trying to shield them from those worries so they can blossom. Yeah. But I, I'm going to tell you, this is completely offshoot, but just because you <laughs> mentioned raising children, which I've raised two amazing kids. Um, but when my I don't know if it was my first or second was born. My AD, who is a prize winning, prize winning dog breeder. Oh, wow. Gave me a dog training book for a parenting gift. And I have to tell you, it was amazing and really, really helpful. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, I am not, I am not kidding you. Mickey Caparelli, I remember the, uh, you know, she's still a friend of mine. And, uh, you know, Westminster Dog Show, we're talking about big. Right. big she knows what she's doing. But I have to tell you, certain things about training dogs is really good to know about training kids. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, I don't have kids yet. Um, but uh, hearing uh, my friend who, you know, she's recently become a mom talking about when it's time for potty training. And every time after potty, she gets a treat. And, you know, I have a dog now. And I'm like, well, he gets a treat too when I take him potty. But I feel like I, I personally feel like I'm being tricked in that situation because with the dog, I feel like it's more work for me than him going potty on himself. So it's like, wait, 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 when we come back inside, I should get the treat for having to deal with that. Yeah, yeah. What was, do you remember the name of the book? I don't. I could ask Mickey. If I, let, let me see if she remembers. Okay. Yeah, I'll I add think, it. I, I think I'll it's not it on the my shelf notes. anymore because I probably lent it to another parent. <laughs> right. Um, do you? Do any of the like correlations come to mind? Yes, I'll right tell now? you. I'll tell oh. you one immediately. Okay. Um, uh, when you make a decision, stick to it, and be and and instantly enforce it. Like for instance, I'll tell you the correlation. 
So whenever I was leaving someplace or I was leaving, let's say a party with the kids, I would never say we're leaving and then, you know, start the round of goodbyes and it would be a half an hour before we left. That doesn't, yeah. that's a mixed message. I never said we're leaving until we were really leaving. So that when I said we're leaving, because we're, knew we were leaving. Yeah. So it was, it was, it, sometimes it was just about that, you know, little things like that. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they, they, you know, we're leaving and then talking for twenty minutes, is um, sends is a complex thing to understand to a three or four year old. Right, and then they kind of learn to not take you seriously because you don't yeah. act immediately on what you say. So it's like, oh, it's not really meant right now. That's yeah, yeah. makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I didn't mean. I said I think I said training the kids. I think I meant raising the kids. <laughs> oh, I I didn't even hear training. So yeah, I did, and I went, oh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Uh, um, where to go from here now? Let's see. Oh, well, <laughs> let's talk about how about training directors or teaching. What, what do you find, um, anything that's especially fun or potentially frustrating in moments when you're, you're teaching actors or directors? Well, you know what? Teaching directors is, is, is really a gift. I mean, I did it for 10 years, um, on the faculty of USC and now I do it a lot for training programs and a huge amount of, um, diversity and advocacy programs for women or um, uh, people of color, whatever. Um, I, um, what I have found is, and, and this is just, you know, there's, there's rookie mistakes that people make. And if you can kind of get ahead of those and say, hey, watch that you don't do this, because we all do, I did, everybody did, does, but don't, or try mm -hmm. not to, or notice when you are doing it. Yeah. Um, but I would say that's, you know, like things like most young directors over talk things. And my, 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 uh, instruction is keep your eyes on the, uh, your eyes on the eyes of the actor. And especially when we're going to all be in masks, the moment you see that, oh, I understand what you're saying. You don't even need to finish your sentence. Walk away. Because the moment that, that thing happens in the actor's eyes, like, their start, their creative process has started. Right. Walk away to take advantage of how they want to use that note you just gave them. So stop explaining. Shh. I literally say, shut up, walk out of the set and say action. Or roll the camera, whatever. Um, but the other thing you said, you know, of what is some, some, one of the treats. The treat is when you meet someone who has the package the perfect package for being a great director. Now, that's not to say that people who don't have that package mm -hmm. um, can't become great directors. You know, some of them are, have a wildly good imagination. Some understand stories. Some have a visual sense that's impeccable and are missing that leadership skill. So there's, there's all those things to being a good director. And I don't think you're a great director without all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so in terms of that, I, um, when you see a package that you just go, oh, wow, it's, you just, you know, you know, you know, and then what you want to do is go, hey, everybody come look and give this one a chance. This one, you know, or it's sometimes that note I get from somebody saying, you know what, Mary Lou, you told me I needed to work on this mm -hmm. and I have, and it's made all the difference. So, you know, that's, that's, listen, that's very, very gratifying. So, um, my success is everyone else's success. And, you know, my legacy is not that, oh, she directed this many episodes or she wrote this many books or, you know, um, I'm hoping it was, she paved the way for next generation. And that generation looked different from the previous generation. That's what I want. Yeah. That's what I want to be known for. Do you find that you ran into, like, I feel like this is such a dumb question because- uh, No dumb question. So, okay, thanks. I'm like, it's a patriarchal society. So it's like, you know, but were there certain um, like roadblocks or ch challenges? Well, that you'd my like motto to... is there are no roadblocks, only detours. Hey, hey. <laughs> nice. So, so were there a, a, a bunch of detours I had to take? Please. <laughs> it was it was ridiculous 
Um, I mean, case in point, there was a point, uh, uh, I know that I was signed the, within one, four weeks of another director who had very, 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 very similar credits to mine. Um, and I was at a very good point in my career. I mean, I was working steadily. I hardly got an interview for a year and a half. And that other director worked, worked, worked. He was a man. Wow. <laughs> now, yeah. now, that's not to say that maybe part of that was, first of all, it was my fault for staying that long with something that wasn't working. Mm -hmm. Another great life lesson. Um, you know, walk away. Um, a bad agent is worse than no agent. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and... Um, yeah, so, uh, uh, yes, there's always those things, but you can't look at them that way. I mean, if I, if I, if I complained or whined or, you know, it was, no, I, you know, I just put blinders on and said, right. this is what I do, this is, uh, and, and just keep trying. You know, I, I'll tell you, the biggest compliment, I get it from, like, close, close friends who have known me over many, many years, they, when they say, you know, Mary Lou, your tenacity you know, you deserve the success you're having because of all the work you put into it. And, um, and you know, I have to say that's not, that's not um, singular to my career. It's true for almost any career. Yeah. You know, um, Malcolm Gladwell talks about putting in those hours. The Beatles put in those hours because, yeah. you know, so you put in those hours. Um, and as long as there's a basis and that you're good at it. Um, right. My friend Todd Holland's says four essential things to being a successful director. Joy, you can never lose your joy. You must always expand, uh, you must always work on your craft. You must always expand your network, joy, craft, network. And he says, repeat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. If you go, after you, actually, if you go to the website, because he gave us permission, he gave Bethany Rooney and me permission to put it on our website. There's a little, um, Beautiful graphic for that, Joy Craft Network Repeat, if you want to be inspired. And the way you get to it is go to Focal Press, which is the publisher for two of my books. Focal Press, go to Directors Tell the Story, go to Companion Website, and that is there, along with some other fabulous things. Video interviews, you know, little uh, lists, like 10 things to think about before you block a scene, eight things you should say to a editor, eight things to talk about when you talk to a director of photography. You know, it, there's just a lot of other stuff to help yeah. you be good at what you do. Thank you. Focal Press, uh -huh. Directors Tell Story Companion website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And awesome. it's, it's not as easy as you think because it's a British company. So everything that we kind of think of it, that, that you're going to click on things in the lower right corner, it's in the upper left. Ah, uh. <laughs> you'll find a companion website. Awesome. Um, and so thanks for sharing some of those sort of rookie, you know, rookie things to look out for. What would you say in your experience with actors, sort of rookie actors versus these other incredible actors you get to? Well, I, and this is, this is sad, but the best sort of actor to come on, not as a series regular, but as a guest star. And that's the way I meet most people. Um, uh, is an actor who will come on stage having done their homework, coming prepared, coming with ideas, doing their work and leaving. So it's the actor that needs, and, and listen, I am the most supportive director for actors. I'm known as an actor's director, but, um, and I very much guide performances, but for someone who has to, constantly be reassured. I want someone to come on with confidence yeah. and not, and not need, and, and not that I can't give it if it's needed, especially for something that you're doing that's particularly risky or whatever, or out of your normal, you know, wheelhouse. But the person who just takes up, they're like time vampires. Mm -hmm. I wish I could tell you that, you know, in the theater, there's way more time for that. And I love the theater for that reason where we can, you know, but um, in a TV schedule. Right. Uh, yeah. And, and um, there's sort of, you have bigger fish to fry. Time is money. And it's just, 
You're not there to babysit. Yeah. No. On the other yeah. hand, I had an actor who I worked with multiple times on multiple projects who, um, who would come in and she'd literally be waiting for me at the door. And she goes, you know, that scene I have this day <laughs> today, there's three ways I could go with it. So, and then, and then I go, okay. And I just stop where I was. I go, go. And she would show me, she goes, I could go this way. I could go this way. And usually it was a joke or a bit or something, but she had worked on it and she yeah. just wanted me to choose one. And I always had a choice because, mm. and not that they all weren't good because mm -hmm. this, this woman is a remarkable, Tanya Gennady. She's just a remarkable actress um, and gifted and creative and fun. And I mean, I just adore her, but that's the way she would say, I'm not going to take up a lot of your time. I thought about this. I've done my homework. Choose. And it was like, <laughs> like a little present. Each yes. <laughs> I got to set, set and there would be a little Gunati present. <laughs> I love that idea. That's fun. Yeah. Um, taking a long pause to think about what's next. Um, let's see. Pause for myself. Uh, oh, so um, I guess what I'm curious about too is what, uh, aside, I know you gave the pillars of like a great director, but for you personally, uh, what is it that drives, drives you to continue with, with your work, whether it's teaching or directing, writing? Oh, uh, like I, I, you know, it's the title of the directors tell the story. It's about telling stories. I know that from the first book I read, and I'm a huge, huge reader. I mean, I wish I could tell you, my, my Kindle now reports to me how many days and how much I'm reading. It's like, it's obscene. And then I watch a huge, I consume a huge amount of television and films. So um, uh, I have to say, I've always been drawn to telling stories, but also because as an audience, how I've been moved by stories. So they've, like, for instance, my book club that I belong to in my neighborhood, we read a book that I would say universally, um, a lot of us had problems with. Some of it was just the subject matter was so horrific and difficult. And, you know, it's, you know, when you realize that women being raped is a part of a war strategy, you know, it's, it's hard. Um, but also in the way it was written, although poetic, it's actually shortlisted or longlisted for a booker, we found it challenging to understand, to follow. So there would be discussions in my book club about what, it, what, what really happened here? Was that a dream sequence? Was that real? Was, I mean, so it was confusing. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, the discussion we had, because the subject matter was so rich, was so fabulous. We had one of our best book club meetings, you know, amongst the nine or 12 women in the group. Um, so when I leave a movie or I finish a book and I can talk about it with friends, you know, stories for me, and it's, and it's why I'm attracted much more to, to stories than nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, I just love that they transport us not only intellectually, but emotionally. And I think when you've taken an emotional journey, and it's one of the things I, you know, I, I say to people when they're interviewing or they're writing a cover letter, tell a story, tell your story, because someone can read a resume and see what you've done, but they get no sense of who you are or what's important to you. You know, don't leave, a, don't leave an interview without talking about things other than the job at hand yeah let them see you you know because it's it's about i i think this is a, a, true about any workplace but particularly about show business um it, it's how you fit in mm -hmm. you know and i have to tell you and similarly i've gone in and watched shows i mean i remember i distinctly just before um i'll remember his name too i interviewed with a man named peter corona Corona, oh boy, the, of the virus, um, <laughs> who couldn't have been more elegant and lovely. And it was Netflix was the first people to say, "Hey, let's stop doing these in-person interviews. Let's do start doing it on Zoom or, you know, whatever it was on." 
So we did this interview and I remember uh, my agents and he had asked me to look at three series that Netflix was doing. And although I had worked with the star of one of them and had a great working relationship with that star, um, I looked at it and went, I'm not the right person for this, mm. for this show. And then there was another one where I go, I'm perfect for this. <laughs> so at the same time, but, yeah. he, but he said something to me after that interview, or maybe he remarked to my agent, he said, it's so refreshing that you didn't say, oh, I'm right for this. I'm right for all of it. I can do anything. The fact is, you're not best suited to everything. You can, you're probably suited, you know, directors direct, and we can do, you know, but my, my co-author Bethany Rooney and, and dear friend says, you know, a director has to fall in love with every every episode they direct or every movie they direct and if it's going to be difficult for you to fall in love with that story or this genre or this you know it's you know i'm 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 about to do a show now for disney channel i haven't worked for them in decades wow and i'm so excited to go back and be working with kids which was my life you know, I had so many kid-centric shows over the years, and I loved every moment of it. And I can't wait to get back to working with, you know, a predominantly, a cast of predominantly of minors. Wow. Yeah. And well, because, you know, they're at points in their life. I'm sorry for interrupting. Oh, no, you just read my mind. <laughs> where they're learning and growing and discovering who they are. And some of that sometimes is painful. You know, I remember a producer coming up, I was called in on a show because um, an actress was having a, a particularly hard problem and, and I worked with her and I thought, problem here is, <laughs> is, not the, is not the work, is not the acting work. She was having, she was in a little, you know, teenage love affair with Aww. a co-star who treated her alternately on days beautifully and then shabbily. Oh, and on the days where it was shabbily, she was a mess. And, and it interfered with the work. But, you know, some of that is, you know, she's juggling, you know, kids, they're juggling school, they're juggling growing up, and they're juggling a full-time job. Yeah. So, you know, uh, unless you have empathy to all of those, my agent used to say to uh, executives when, you know, he would be pitching me for a job, he'd say, you know, Mary Lou actually likes kids. <laughs> you know, and with well, and with my children, you know, especially my son, who is, a, who is, and was from the time he was three or four years old, one of the most gregarious people on the planet. Our house was the gathering place. I mean, even you know, to this day, you know, I emailed uh, one of his high school kids who would always come in, and he knew knew I loved Gershwin, and he'd sit down at a piano and play me Rhapsody in Blue. I would, if he was staying for dinner, so I would cook, and I would be listening to him. You know, so, I mean, those kids in my, those other students in my kid's life are still a part of my life. I mean, I thought about sending my son some pistachios today, you know, as a little, uh, you know, gift from mama. Uh -huh. And I thought, no, no, I didn't buy these pistachios for my kid. I bought them for his best friend. Hoping <laughs> his best friend will stop by. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's working with kids has its joy and, um, and you know you have to to go back to your query um you have to love what you're doing and you're not going to be right for everything so yeah. there's going to be interviews where you go not not the right match and i will go after an interview like that and say i don't know if i'm going to get this and and then i'll follow it with him i don't know that i want it ah yes you no know, i've come out of like i'm going to just tell you i, I won't ma name the show but one of the most misogynist meetings I had ever had. And I just came out, I wanted to take a shower. Oh. And I thought working with these people on a daily basis, despite the fact that I loved the show and I loved some of the actors on it, I thought, you know, that's only half my job. The other half is dealing with right. these assholes I had a meeting with. And I went, I don't want to deal with that. Yeah. Life is too short. You know, but, yeah. you don't have to be that way. There's plenty of wonderful, exciting, creative, kind people in the business. Yeah. Your life's too short to work with a-holes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Um, yeah. 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 I, uh, I love that idea of just like falling in love with stories and, and recognizing what's really in line with who you are and what isn't. 
And just speaking from an actor perspective, I know it took a little while after I finished grad school to understand, because you know, you're trained, you can play anything, you could do anything. And it's like, sure I can, but um, maybe not as believably and as quickly as that person right there. Like yeah. I've got certain things that are just more in my range and you know, we all vary, but I think it's important to have that sort of um, honesty check with yourself about what yeah. does and doesn't really resonate with you. In my um, children's acting book, Acting for Young Actors, um, I talk about this game that, or this exercise to do, and I adapted it from a, 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 a person here in Southern California named Sam Christensen. And it's basically about knowing your type. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, especially from people who come from the theater and, and try to do a wide range of exploring during their undergrad or graduate work, um, once you get into the, the business, um, there's usually a, a much smaller niche into which you fit. Now, that being said, <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell this whole story. Um, after directing Persia White for years on Girlfriends, I had this idea of what her range was. And it was pretty broad because the character that she played was all over the place mm -hmm. um, in terms of, you know, she was trying, she was going to grad school for this, she was doing this, you know, she always had something else she was exploring as a character. So I thought, oh, I've seen, I've seen a broad range of what Persia can do. Mm -hmm. And then it was, I think, a year or two years later after the show was over and we had kept in touch, she invited me to go see her in a play. What she did in that play blew my mind. I went, I had no idea Persia White was, was could command this kind of character in such a fabulous way. And as a result, uh, when I was casting a series maybe another year later, um, and I thought, I'm gonna bring Persia White in on this. It's not a character I've ever seen her do, but she just showed to me that she had this range that I never imagined. Yeah. Um, or, the, or this range that was beyond what I imagined, because I thought of her as an actress with a lot of range. And to this day, every time I see a new piece of work she does, like whether what she did, she did on Vampire Diaries, whatever, I go, she's amazing. <laughs> she's amazing. She can do anything. So I remember not only bringing her in on that other series, but casting her. Yes. You know, and it was, and she did a fantastic job. That's awesome. Yeah. So you just, you know, um, uh, but at the same time, especially when you're starting, if you can find that little niche right. of how people are going to see you or how you're going to help people know how to cast you. Mm -hmm. And knowing that, I think, is a huge asset. I mean, there's gobs, gobs of acting career coaches um, or people who teach about the business of the business. Mm -hmm who will almost all of them hit on it. And in my, my book, um, Acting for the Screen, um, particularly Gilly Messer and uh, Bonnie Gillespie um, talk about that. And as does Peter Kukuza, a university professor, who talks about you know just things you need to assess about yourself and your talent um, before you go out into the workplace. Um, and so when I have people call me up and say, hey, I'd love to be seen for this. And I, and I think there's not in a million years that I would cast you in that role. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to someone who, you know, there's, I'll, I will tell you, there's a, um, a wonderful actor named Phil Abrams, who is always ridiculously respectful. And he's not the only one, but will shoot me a quick email saying, Mary Lee, um, think I'm right for this one? And 90% of the time, he's right. And he doesn't shoot me those emails all the time. It's only when it's particularly something I'm directing and he's perfect for the part. Yeah. So it's those kind of actors who are very savvy and strategic and respectful. You know, I don't want a thousand actors saying, hey, see me for this, see me for this, see me for this. It's, you know, um, that. I wish I had time to answer those kind of notes. But at the same time, when someone hasn't, you know, contacted me in a year and a half, but they're perfect. And I go, oh my, so I'm so glad Phil contacted me because he's perfect for this. Mm -hmm. And I haven't thought about him in a while because, you know, you know, even yeah. though he works all the time. Yeah. 
that makes sense. I think there's a certain, um, obviously like self-awareness that actors need to have of like, what's the role that you could just get cast in today without like, just easy. It's as easy as breathing for you. And then mm -hmm. sure, develop those other aspects of yourself and sh show it so that you'll fit into those other things. Cause I mean, I, per I wouldn't say like, well, don't train those things, but just be aware of what, what you fit into, what you don't, and then maybe what you'll change people's minds with when they see you and go, whoa, you can do that. Yeah, but, but a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're telling stories with pictures. Mm -hmm. We're telling stories fast. Yep. And not, I'm ta not talking about how fast we have to do the work. I'm talking about how, some, how quickly someone has to appear on screen. And for the story to be effective, I have to know, are they a seedy character? Are they a kind character? Are they mean? Are they nice? You know, there's, there's all sorts of things that before you even open your mouth, and speak your first line, I'm already telling my story because someone has an impression of what you exude. Right. So, um, and if you don't understand that that's part of the film and television medium, or even the theater medium, but you know, the theater, you have a, a little, a lot more time. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's pretty, it's gotta be instant recognition or, or, Recognition to, like, for instance, I had to cast a part um, that was going to be recurring in a series I've done for many, many years. And uh, there was a couple ways I could have gone with it, but she was going to be the new girlfriend of a character that the audience knew already. And the audience also knew that, was also in love with the, the present wife who was about to be the divorcee. Um, and that divorcee was a series regular. So I had to protect that character. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't bring in a new girlfriend who was mean or stupid or, I mean, she had to genuinely like her and the audience had to genuinely like her. So when I was casting, although I had one choice I could have gone with, with this person who was really smart and really, you know, seemed like a perfect match for this guy. I went with a person who just exuded nice more because I wanted the audience to say, the divorced character is gonna like this person because who wouldn't? She's right. really nice. So that became part of what I was looking for when I was casting. Yes. Not only you know, somebody who could do the scenes and you know, you know, look great next to this other person and be their intellectual equal and have a great relationship with the daughter that, you know, th these people were going to have to co-parent now. So it was, uh, but I cast someone who was all those things and nice. Yeah, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. As opposed to all those things and guarded. Yes. Not a choice for my storytelling. And, and when you're talking about how important it is, like being in a, you know, it's a visual medium, so the audience has to get it right away. Yeah. I'm just curious how, because I know you're also an activist, but how does, hmm, I'm just thinking of like a, a very traditional sort of like um, very thin, young, blonde, or sort of like love interest type versus yeah. like, you know, um, just going to say like black women getting to have their natural hair on TV. I didn't see that for ages. And I think the first time Thank I saw you, it, Tracy Ross. right. I'm That's crying it. like tears well, of well, joy. And also you know? Chris Rock for that amazing movie. Yes. Yeah. I, and if anybody has not seen it, run out and see it right now. <laughs> America must see this, you know, so, um, so yes, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so I want to just talk about that. Um, we always need to expand our idea of what that is. And I'll, I'll tell you, and it's, a, and it's a question, and it's a lesson I learned the, the bad way. I was volunteering for a wonderful organization called Girls Inc., which is kind of, people said it's Girls Club, but it was way, way more. It was about empowering young women. And when I had my training before I ever got to interact with any of the girls in the program, they did this, um, this little exercise with us. And they said, uh, draw a picture of a professor. Yeah, I drew a, or, or a lab technician mm -hmm. or a doctor, you know, a doctor. And a, so 
you know, yeah, I put on the, 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 the scrubs or the, you know, the, the, um, the outfit. I put glasses on and he was a white male. And I have to tell you, when you do that and you take a look at yourself and you just go, wow, I did that. And it was a great, not only professional um, lesson to me, but a great uh, life lesson mm -hmm. that now, uh, you know, it's, and it's much more, not only what they look like, but remember I said what coming from inside. Yep. The energy, that, right? That energy. And that, that's an yeah. exercise that, you know, the Sam Christensen thing that I mentioned in um, uh, acting for young actors um, it, it's addressing that. It's not just what you look like. It's the essence of you. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, yeah. And you know, and there's so many other marginalized groups. It's not just, oh, you know, right. it, it, you know, looking at people's color of their skin. It has to do with, you know, uh, people in the deaf community, any people, you know, who are handicapped and, or, uh, challenged in any other way. People, um, there's just so many people. Right. Age, so, weight, all sorts. Age, of. weight. Yeah. And you just go. Yeah. So. Yeah. But it is, it is great to hear that energy matters. Of course, energy matters. I mean, but I mean, hearing from somebody that you're aware of that in your casting and, you know, it, it's, uh, so for any of, you know, the actors out there who are just feeling down, like maybe you don't look a certain way or not it's it's more than just how we look on the outside but more so it's there's room for every single type of everybody in the business for those stories and even more so now because as the more our storytelling opens up and the more diverse story writers start mm -hmm. telling those other stories there's going to be that perfect niche it's it's um it's great it's great because, you know, the world needs not just stories that relate to, you know, I won't talk about what that stereotype is <laughs> and who's been telling so many of those stories for so many years. But let me just say, you know, go people like Kimberly Pierce and Mara Brock Akio and all those people who are telling other great stories out there, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I do think that's another great thing. Um, well, one of the great things about social media is, you know, people can see, oh, we're enjoying content from all sorts of people. Yeah. It's kind of the democratization of storytelling. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So um, we're almost at time, um, but I do want to ask you uh, if there's, again, just in light of all of, all of these awesome stories that you've uh, taken us uh, through, any sort of life lessons or takeaways for people of things that you've learned from your, your artistic process? Yeah. You know what? Um, uh, and I say this when I teach, uh, or when I advocate, um, a great thing to follow is give to get. So get rid of that entitlement that you're owed anything. You're not think more of being generous and offering what you have to other people and, and they, when noting your generosity, will want to give back. I love that. Just give. And it's also flowing that energy, that giving energy. And I think it opens us up to enjoy our lives more anyway, because our mind like our whole everything shifts yeah listen yeah. when i get an email from somebody and they said i retweeted something or i love what you did you know i posted it i reposted or something like that someone's given me something hmm. i'm much more inclined to go oh wow that was very nice of that person to do it and then i'm more inclined to help them because it wasn't mary lou can you do this for me yes right so think about that in your own life, apply it, and then see how, it, how you feel when people ask you for things. Because I will tell you, this business has a lot of vampires in it. And I don't mean the kind, <laughs> you know, that have diaries. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about leeches, people who are selfish and self-centered and single-minded about their success and will 
and think it should come at the cost of everybody. And um, yes, I will tell you some of those people are hugely successful because of that mindset. But does it make me want to be around them or help them with their career? Not much. But then you meet someone who is, who gives back. I mean, I mean, let's just look at Yvette Nicole Brown. I mean, a remarkable human being, you know, who deserves all the success. And I just can't wait. You know, I have to tell you, in terms of how people cast her, they know she's funny, they know she's warm, they know she's got a great voice, you know, in terms of strong character that you can cast. She has a talent that the world has not seen yet. I won't tell you what it is. But oh. the world, I hopefully, in her long career, will see it. But she's immensely talented in an area that no one has tapped yet. <gasps> okay. <laughs> definitely. I hope everybody's curious. Yes, definitely curious. Oh, uh, and okay, I know that was going to be the last question, but when you're talking about the the vamp the the non diary vampires, the vampires don that don't shimmer in the light, <laughs> um, what are some things? that you can recommend for people so that they can still be warm and giving and uh, okay, avoid, so, you know, avoid the, vamp the vampires. So if you have those, set boundaries. Yeah. I will do this. Um, and, and just be very clear on it. I think honesty is the, the easiest thing. And then if those people are just, you know, just draining you completely, you know, have that frank conversation is I can't do this anymore. Yeah. You know, this is not, a, this is not a tenable relationship for me. Um, or a nicer way of saying is, you know, I'm concentrating my, my advocacy work or this on this right now. Right. Moving on so that you can do it politely. But I have to tell you, sometimes those people don't take subtle <laughs> <laughs> they don't read subtlety very much. And um, I always try to be kind, but it, sometimes you just have to, you know, and, and, you know, I, I only learned this by getting hurt, but uh, my husband always says, watch your back, watch your back. And I don't like to watch my back, yeah. but, but, you know, they say, fool me once, shame on me, fool me, no, shame fool on me you, once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah. Um, I do believe in that. You know, sometimes it's fool me thrice. <laughs> I know it doesn't rhyme. And sometimes, sometimes you've got to burn me twice before I go, you're not healthy for me. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then at the same time, my heart overflows with people, you know, listen, you come to me and you tell me 10 things you're doing yourself for your career. And I can guide you into possibly prioritizing those things. You come to me and go, I don't know what to do. Not as helpful. So, um, you know, my mother used to say, God helps those who help themselves. Well, you know what? That's a good career, career advice too, mom. Yes. <laughs> yes, that is. Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank you again so much for your time. I'm just, uh, yeah, very grateful for it. And um, once again, please remember to follow her at www.maryloubelli.com on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then of course, if you're looking for a coach to help you with performance skills to bring more of your full self and voice, body, and mind to your life and work, you can always reach me at beyondtechniquecoaching at gmail.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, share, Every five-star review and comment just helps get the message out. And you can always support at Patreon at Beyond Technique with Samantha Rond. Thanks so much and stay safe and stay healthy.